Hi, my name is Karen Raz, and I'm a Reynolds Fellow from the Law School. Is this on? Okay. Um, my question for you is, how do you get kids to stay in school? Um, what have you found has worked? What have you found does not work? Is my question an ignorant one? <laughs> in the school, you're talking about the, yeah. the school. What does work and does not work? Mm -hmm. um, what works is um, commitment, dedication, caring, you know, and, uh, and be there all the time, you know, leadership. Like any other organization, most problems are management problems. Uh, your teachers will be lazy if you don't, you know, <laughs> monitor and hold people accountable. So most problems are management problems. If you have a good management, most things work. I, I hate to sound like a businessman uh, in a poverty issue, but it is true. Uh, you run a good organization, well managed, it'll work. What doesn't work um, is um, you, um, you know, you leave it to, uh, at least for me, that's the way I, you know, I leave it to local empowerment and all those things are great words to use. But without accountability, it doesn't work. You know, people get mad at me if I say something like this, you know, empowerment is only up to a point, you know. Um, you need to bring, motivate people and so on, but if you leave it to the local management, it'll be all corruption, and they'll take your money, and you will see nothing on the ground. Um, there are many things that don't work, but, you know. Good management is what works. Um, hi. My name is Lauren Servan. I'm a 2008 Reynolds Fellow. And uh, my question is, so there must be a large disconnect between the students and their families back in the village. I was wondering if you, how do they relate to each other if you have seen them do that? And then um, I have a second question, sorry. And um, once they graduate, uh, do they go back and try to create change in their own communities? OK. This is a very valid question. Uh, but remember that unlike, uh, unlike uh, some indigenous people living in some remote mountainous area. Uh, these are not indigenous people. They are they just next door is a landlord who's got a nice TV, and this person is living in a hut right next door and you know, starving. Okay, So uh, just be sure that what we are talking about. What, if you ask any of these children, what do they want? They want, they'll tell you, if you ask them, those who have been there, well, first thing is I want to make a lot of money. Then I want to build a nice house for my mom. Then I want to have a car. And maybe I can have a helicopter. <laughs> this, this is what the children want. They want to change their lives. We cannot leave, leave the burden of India's culture, preserving India's culture or rural, all this stuff to the poor while the rich send their children to Stern. Poor should be able to go anywhere they want. Now, what do they do with their money? As I said, that is for them to choose. If they want to help a child in Africa, that's where they should help. If they want to help somebody in their village, they make their choices. We are nobody to tell them. What we owe them is opportunity, nothing more. Opportunity. Give them the opportunity to succeed and be honest about it and leave it to them. Bring them up with values, the value of giving, the value of caring, the value of being sensitive. Those things, if you do well, they will be fine. You know, we worry about leadership qualities and interpersonal communication and all that. All that are important, but there are humane qualities that we want these children to have. And you can list them, generosity, kindness, sensitivity, all these are important things. The idea of giving back, the idea of helping another person, caring. Can, how do you bring about all these things? If you do all, if you can Im impact them in some way with these humane values, by examples, not by telling them stories, by real example, then you will find that they will do the right thing, whatever is good for them. You don't tell them they have to do these things. You don't tell them they have to serve their community. You don't tell them.
that they have to fit in with their culture of untouchables. They don't want to be untouchables. It's not a burden we want to leave for them. Uh, hi, my name is Seal Sun Lim. I'm a fellow, a Reynolds fellow at the Gallatin School of Individualized Studies. So um, before I ask my question, I have to say that I don't know very much about the social and political structure right, in India. But doing community development work in the US, um, I think that you know, for those of us who do, it's very obvious that um, there are historic and political and structural reasons for social and, and economic inequity, right? So um, the folks that I work with feel like, you know, at the same time that we're building schools, educating, empowering young people in low-income communities of color, we have to do other things to address those structural problems, Correct. right? So campaigns, lobbying, whatever it is. Correct. I'm wondering um, how the, your foundation sees the structural problems in India and then what you're doing to address them. Uh, very good question. Uh, very difficult to answer this also because uh, what America faces, uh, you know, in all these issues is uh, uh, problems associated with wealth. In India, it's problems associated with lack of wealth. Okay. Uh, here we have, you know, we can spend trillions of dollars on hedge funds or bailing out banks and trillions of dollars. Here, there, there you can't even spend four dollars on a kid going to Shandibhan. Okay. So the problems are very different. Now, the structural problems, the, you know, the couple of things. Uh, bad governance is the reason for poverty. You, can, you cannot change the society very easily if the, the system is poor. There is no justice. You cannot go to a court and get justice. If the, the whole place is corrupt, OK, and you discriminate people. If you have all these things, it's very difficult to fix the problem. Now, how do you bring about the change? You know, maybe through journalism, maybe through the media, maybe through the election process, maybe through activists. You know, so these are structural problems that will take many, many years to overcome. But the best hope we have is that we work with few people, well-meaning people, both adults and bring up children like Chandiban children who will change the world. That's our hope. I don't know how we can bring about change. People just, if I talk to any Indian, you know, how do you change corruption? They said, it's not possible. Imagine, you know, a father coming to the dining table at dinner time, a well, you know, well educated, making good money, uh, who talks about all the bad things about corruption. But then in the lunch or dinner, he's talking how he bribed somebody to get electricity or something connected for his house. And everybody laughs. It's OK for him, but it's not OK for anybody else. If you have a culture like that, you know, if you have a culture where you know, spitting outside is OK, but you don't spit, your house is OK, but the moment you step out, you spit, well, you have a problem. So the question is, how do you bring about the change in the way people look at social issues and, uh, and bring about change. All you can do is do on a small scale. Uh, and if hundreds of people do similar things, I have a feeling it will change, short of a revolution, I suppose. <laughs>